who are online or will be watching us later. Welcome to those who are here in person this morning. Um, it's good to gather in the presence of the Lord and in one another's presence, because that encourages us, doesn't it, to, throughout the week, to remember the goodness of God and of his people. A um, couple of announcements this morning. Just want to remind those who are visiting with us, or perhaps have only been with us once or twice, um, that we do have cards in the chairs in front of you. You can see little packets of them. And we encourage you to fill those out. There are some pens at the back if you don't have one with you. And then to drop them in the offering plate, which is at the back, just by the doors there. Um, and then that gives us a way to make sure that we get in touch with you if you're visiting with us. Um, and the other uh, reminder is around the offering plate. So certainly there's no obligation for people to give toward the operation of the church, but um, if you feel inclined to do so, you feel that God is leading you to provide us with some financial support, the offering plate is at the back there, um, and you're welcome to put something in that. If you uh, want a, um, a receipt for what you give, we certainly provide those, um, and there are envelopes that you can use for that. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can check with me afterwards. Um, also, just want to remind you that next week is a special week, because Pastor George isn't going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> is that how that came out? <laughs> no, it, it, uh, what, what, he gets to have a little holiday. Um, but the NEMA Children's Choir is going to be here next week. So this is a great time to in invite um, friends and family to come and join us for a really special celebration with the NEMA Children's Choir, <clears throat> who will share with us their love of God as they've been traveling um, really around the world to share that with others. Um, and then on August 7th, which is like a month and some from now, uh, we are having Teen Challenge uh, to come and minister to us. After church today, there is a business meeting. So it, is, it will be a short meeting, and it is a chance where we will have to um, vote for people who, are, who have mm -hmm. been nominated to join the board. Uh, the board of, uh, the leadership board here at church, there will be elders, deacons, and officers being voted in. So if you're a member of the church, if you're not a member and you want to stay and uh, watch and be a part of what's going on, it's members only will be able to vote. So please stay here and have a little coffee and then come back to have that meeting, and it, it shouldn't be too long. Okay, change our focus now a little bit <laughs> to the time that we have together. In Psalm 113, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. Please stand and join us.
pray. Father, thank you that you are indeed with us, here and everywhere. Father, I pray that we will pay attention to you, to the peace that you seek to give us, to the nudging that you seek to give us, to care for others and to pay attention to others. And Father, we invite you to fill us this morning, to pour your Holy Spirit on us as we listen, as we share, as we pray, as we speak, to hear your voice. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Father. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill us today in Jesus' name. There's a lot of words on this next page, so I'll, I'll trust you to carry me if I get lost. <laughs> For 
we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take out the shield of faith, which you make to the all the of the evil And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Thank you. May God bless the reading of his word. Please stand and join us.
morning. Technology is working. Excellent. Well, we're going to come to God with our prayers and thoughts and concerns and praises and just thank Him for this morning. Well, it's not beautifully sunny, it's not snowing. So praise God. <laughs> Dear Lord, just thank you so much for this place. Thank you for allowing us a, a place, a town, a country to worship you in freedom. We thank you so much for the ability to, to gather together, to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to be a part of each other's lives. Help us to feel you in this place, Lord. Help us to allow your presence to be in our lives. Not only in this place, but in our community, in our workplaces, in our schools, on vacation, wherever we're going to be, Lord. Just allow you to be an active force in our lives. Help us to rely on you. Help us to, to trust in your strength and your wisdom. We thank you so much for the ability to celebrate and, and uh, worship you. Lord, we bring forth concerns about things in our lives. We thank you so much for the ability to go out and, uh, and be who you need us to be in this world. We think of Jody and uh, the summer camp that she's going to. Thank you so much for the ability for her to go out there. We pray for her experiences out there to be positive, uplifting, and praiseworthy. Think of other people who are going to camp as well, and just the ability for them to proclaim you in a gentle way, in a, in a way you need them to be. That they can change lives for you and bring people closer to you. We pray for the leadership that is coming up. We pray for the um, new board members, for the old board members, and just for our whole church as a whole, that you can um, strengthen us, encourage us, um, give us wisdom, give us direction, and the ability to rely on you and to stay true to you in your word and your deed. We pray for health concerns for people for a carry in her wrist and her arm and just pray for healing there. Pray that uh, relief of pain and just a quick healing, quick recovery for her. Think of the Merricks and we just pray for their, their healing and their ability to um, endure through this, their strength and their trust and faith in you. Help them to be a light as they go through this part of their journey in their lives, that you will be strengthening them, encouraging them. Pray for all people who are traveling in the summer, pray for safe travels, that you watch over people who are going far or near. We just pray for the, uh, the summer and the heat and the weather. We just thank you so much for the ability to have a summer. We thank you so much for the time that we can have to share with friends and family. And we just pray as we, as we be amongst our families that we can be that light for you. Pray for the world in general. We pray for the Ukraine and the war that's going on there. It's ongoing. We pray for the strength and courage of the Ukrainian people the support of all the countries that are trying to help them. We just pray for your hand to be in that country, your hand to be in that situation. Lord, we pray for so many things in our lives. We put them to you. We trust in you. We need you in our lives. We pray for our ability to, to stay in your will as we go forward. Thank you for this day. I praise your name in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. And now, George, he's here this week. So. <laughs>
I am here, but someone else is going to be doing something. So. fellowship um, in December. And Anna and Carlos um, came to Canada over 20 years ago from El Salvador and this past month in May they had opportunity to go back and see their family and it was an opportunity that we used to find out what's happening in El Salvador. How's the Lord moving and what do we need to pray for? And so um, we have a small presentation for you tonight, today, it's not tonight, it's daytime. Um, so I'm gonna do little facts about El Salvador, and Anna's gonna talk about the pastor that they know very well there, and uh, what he's doing, and what their church is doing, and the needs that we need to pray for. So, if you're like me, I really didn't know where El Salvador was. I knew it was in Central America, but I wasn't sure, where's the map? It's just, I thought it was down, down near Panama. But anyway, El Salvador means the savior. And its capital is San Salvador, and its official language is Spanish, and they use American money. But it, interestingly enough, it's the smallest country in the continent. It's volcanic. Um, it's on the Pacific Ring. They've had some terrible earthquakes there. It's nice and tropical, and being small, it still has an estimated population of 6.8 million. And 1.2 million of Salvadorians live outside of the country. Uh, Roman Catholicism and Protestant uh, are the religions and some others. Um, so during 79 to 80 to 92 actually, a long time, there was a a pretty severe civil war that really um, was devastating to the people. Of 80,000 were killed and 0.5 million refugees in other countries. And so, um, you know, their economy still struggles. Uh, Anna was telling me they're, they're moving towards more service industry, um, but there's still problems with gangs. And really, it sounded a lot like what happens here. Know, lots of issues with guns and all kinds of things. But they love to play soccer and they surf the waves. Anna says the beaches are phenomenal. And it's, uh, I didn't realize it's mountainous, and so there's lakes and there's uh, the ocean, of course, and then there's the Pre Cumbrian Mayan ruins there. And we know the people are friendly because. We have them here amongst us. <laughs> and they have a special food. Yeah. Uh, this food is um, it's like our, um, it's considered the national fish. It's called pupusa. And it's a mix of the Colombian, Spanish, or European uh, cuisine in Latin America. So it's made of. Um, Corn flour, they make a dough and they um, do like a. Um, they stop this, this dough with uh, cheese or beans or any kind of meat and it's served with uh, pickle, uh, cabbage salad, and uh, uh, tomato sauce. It's, uh, everything is homemade, uh, it's not industrialized. Yeah. So our first, our first potluck, we can have one. We are having that. So Anna's going to talk to us now about 
the pastor and all that he's doing and the church is doing and what's happening. Yeah, um, well, as Kathy uh, told us, uh, we have the opportunity to come uh, back, um, to came back to, uh, last May to our back country because we need to uh, visit our relative May, our mom. And um, we have the opportunity to, to have a meeting with this pastor, uh, his name is Salvador Guevara, right away, Salvador. And he is the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Santa Ana. Santa Ana is the second largest city in El Salvador. And this, um, this church has uh, about uh, 100 years or more. And, but now they only have 100 members. And uh, this is the pastor with his wife. And they have uh, some uh, ministers over there, very interesting ministers. And I am going to share with you. They have medical campaigns, one or two uh, a year. And they have um, the, the, the doctors give or donate their time, uh, the medicines also. Uh, they um, go to this, they are serving a small community that is one of the most impoverished um, communities near the city. And uh, they run this medical campaign, they bring medicine, they bring the doctors, nurses, and uh, vaccination. Of course, they ask for help to some uh, non-profit agencies or sometimes government, but not that much. And um, as well, they have um, food and cloth donation that they can get from other non-profit organizations. For example, uh, Amnesty International, they gave them some of the food that they, they uh, distribute. And um, also, they managed to get some uh, cloth to to, to donate to the people on this um, on this part of the city. Also, they run great classes for uh, black people every Saturday. Uh, one of the members of the church uh, go to this uh, school that um, the, the the city allows this uh, church to borrow this school just to run these classes. They run uh, computer classes, classes during the week for kids and young people. And on Saturday, they run the break classes. Uh, they have a, mini, a ministry with the young, with the youth and children. Uh, usually they attract them uh, because of the sports. So they make like, uh, uh, soccer teams and, and uh, they play ping pong and then after uh, they share uh, the, this sport, they have the Bible studies. Uh, if you can see in the photo on your left, um, there is a group of um, girls because they, they run like a workshop um, about the um, like sexual sexual classes, right? They, they, they uh, is kind of awareness because there is a high percentage of um, um, young girls pregnant, right? So they they wanted to do this in order to uh, help to prevent that, and also they they uh, give meals and refreshment when they. Um, go to these uh, gatherings uh, with the children and youth, they, they, the community or the, the members prepare some food for the kids or for the young people, and they uh, give them on that day. Every, this is every week. And on top of that, there are uh, some evangelistic campaigns at prisons. Uh, they gather all the prisoners and they have services there. There are a lot of conversion now. And um, they uh, go every month to do this, to the prison in the city. 
uh, as well they have uh, worship service with the police and this pastor is also a chaplain and he also uh, teaches in one of the seminars and uh, he held these um, worship services with the police in Santa Ana in the city. And um, I asked him uh, what are his prayer requests for his church. And it was really um, it was like um, encouraged me to to go up to go and do my part because uh, sometimes I feel like I am in my comfort zone and you feel that you need to do more. And uh, this leads me to a question for me, if I am doing enough to spread the gospel, to serve the Lord as, as he wants. And Thank, thank Pastor George because he asked me to uh, to do this, to find out this one at church and to, uh, we had this that encouraged me to do it too. Uh, but it's, it's really um, a challenge for me. And I saw many people with limited resources that give a lot just to serve the Lord. And, um, he, he told me this uh, prayer request. We are going to pray for them. And I ask you, uh, if you have time in you, your prayers to do this, because um, it's not just the, you know, it's, it, there are a lot of needs, not only financial needs, the main, main need is, is um, to know about the Lord, right? Many people, um, are now in, in need to hear about the gospel and uh, still there is a lot to do, a lot. And I, I was thinking, oh, my, my life is going to, what? I, I, maybe I have uh, not that many years left and I need to do something, right? I need to do something that, uh, um, be aligned with uh, God's purpose in my life. And um, his prior requests for his church are this, a spiritual and membership growth, a strong commitment of the church leadership, church finances to support all these ministries, um, this new mission in this uh, impoverished uh, area of the city is, is called now Santa Curia. And they are building a new, a new, like a, a small church there. And they are praying for more conversion and leaders to preach the gospel there. And finally, for the pastoral family health and the spiritual fortress in personal circumstances. And thank you. Thank you, sister. So we're going to just have a quick prayer. I'm going to pray, and Anna's going to pray in Spanish. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for Anna and Carlos for bringing us um, information and uh, the work that you're doing, Lord, in uh, Santa Ana. So Father, we do lift up Pastor and his wife and the ministries. So, there's so many ministries that he's doing that you would strengthen him and, and provide for them spiritually, emotionally, financially. So Lord, we, uh, we are grateful. Uh, that your hand is upon those in, in that area and that you're working mightily to bring uh, people to salvation. I pray for Anna as she um, continues to uh, to lift up her friend and her pastor friend in El Salvador and give her strength. Amen. Eterno Padre Celestial, te damos gracias en esta mañana por tu bondad, Señor, por tu misericordia de cada día porque un día contigo, Señor, es un milagro, un milagro que tú nos has dado esa salvación eterna, Padre Santo. Te damos gracias.
gracias Señor por esta misión, por esta iglesia, por Jimmy School Baptist Church, Señor, yo te pido por los miembros para que tú despiertes en ellos ese fuego para poder seguir sirviéndote, Padre Santo. Igualmente por nosotros, Señor, que estamos acá en una sociedad diferente en la que nacimos, pero Padre, tú tienes un plan. Queremos que tú, Señor, seas el que nos guíe, nos ayude, Señor, a, a seguir, Señor, en, en, en tu reino, proclamando tu reino, Señor. Gracias, Padre, te oramos en el nombre precioso de Cristo Jesús, nuestro Padre Celestial. very much. I am Kathy. I think we have our next uh, short-term mission plan. We know where we'd, we'd like to go. <laughs> we have the language skills and we have the personnel. So we're continuing to look at the story of the church in the book of Acts. And uh, I'd like us to turn to Acts uh, chapter 5. Was it chapter 4? Sorry. Yeah and uh, from verse, verses 32 down through chapter 5, verse 11. So just follow with me, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their position, possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles feet now a man or but a man named ananias together with his wife sapphira also sold a piece of property and with his wife's full knowledge he kept back part of the money for himself but brought the rest and put it at the apostles feet then peter said ananias how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. After three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. May God bless the reading of his word to our hearts and to our understanding this day. It's a very sober text that, isn't it? A rather dark day in the story of the church. You may have heard recently of 50 men, women and children uh, who were gunned down at St. Francis Catholic Church in Owo Nigeria recently. It's reported that those who keep track of these types of this type of information that every day 13 Christians worldwide 
are killed for their faith. Seems to me like the number is higher, but there it is. Every day, 12 churches or church-related buildings are attacked and destroyed. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted. While I'm no expert in the ways of the devil, I do believe certain things about him. One, I believe that he exists. Two, that he is utterly ruthless. And third, that he totally lacks imagination. That may sound kind of curious, but uh, I say this because his tactics have changed have changed little over the millennia. He's still in the same old rut as he was 2,000 years ago. Uh, the story of the church so far, God poured out his spirit, Pentecost ensued, but after Pentecost there was persecution because there's always a spiritual precedent at work throughout the history of the church. Whenever God makes a move, Satan, the enemy mounts a counter-attack. That's just the principle of church life. And Satan essentially attacks on three fronts. He attacks in terms of intimidation and violence. And we saw that in Nigeria. And that has carried on for 2,000 years to our own day. Uh, today I want us to look at a second weapon in Satan's arsenal. When Satan failed to destroy the church, he came up with another tactic. He tried to destroy the church, not from the outside, but from the inside. Inside jobs are always more ruthless and more effective. You think of bank robberies, when it's an inside job, there's inside information, and it usually goes quite well. But we must bear in mind that Luke's concern is not so much to tell us about these tactics, although they're important for us to understand. He also wants to inform us as to how the church overcame these weapons of Satan in the life of the church. How he was defeated. In other words, they're recorded not just for our information, but they're recorded there for us to learn from these things. For us to benefit, for our instruction. In Canada, we don't really meet with physical violence or intimidation as believers in Christ, at least not yet, but there is considerable attack from inside churches. So we need to be aware of these tactics as a congregation. And we need to be prepared for it when it happens. So may let's, we pray that God will open our eyes as we look at this story together. The first thing I want you to notice is, notice is the occasion of Satan's attack. When it happened, we see this in verses 32 to 37. All times, the devil attacks us by surprise. Things were going well in the Jerusalem church, both the passage before this and the passage after that. After this, this was a high point in the life of the church, and Luke paints this beautiful picture of the church. Uh, in Jerusalem. In answer to prayer, during this first attack of intimidation and violence, uh, the church is once again filled with the Spirit of God. And the results are immediately visible. They remained a united church. Look at verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. Sadly, there are, there are churches, there are some churches that lack unity. They're all going off in different directions at once. And uh, not only do such churches stagnate, but they also are a poor testimony for the Lord and for the Gospel. But not First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. It was at a high point. It was going well. They were wide in one heart, of one heart and mind. Secondly, they, they continue to be a missional church. If you look at verse 33 again, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they kept the main thing, the main thing, preaching the gospel. I appreciate that slide presentation of the past and the church there in El Salvador. They continued to bear witness to the gospel. 
Thirdly, they continue to be a sharing church. Look at their radical attitude toward uh, possessions. Verse 34, And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, that no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Just sort of try to put yourself in that picture 2,000 years ago. To get the gist of this, of what Luke is saying, imagine some of us taking out the equivalent of a reverse mortgage on our property, on our homes, and taking the proceeds, proceeds of that reverse mortgage and sharing it with the people within the congregation, those who had need. Can you imagine that? That's what I call sacrificial giving. We hear sometimes preaching say, preachers say, give till it hurts. Well, it's not so much what you give, it's what you hold back. Well, this was radical. This was generosity, extraordinary generosity. And just look at the results. There were no needy persons among them, but from, the time, from time to time, those who owned land, no houses, sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Once again, I want to repeat this. These were voluntary acts. These were not uh, commands for people to sell their houses. This was strictly voluntary. But you see, this is what happens when the Spirit of God is poured out in power. And this generosity is epitomized by a na man named Barnabas. Well, his real name was actually Joseph, but they gave him the nickname Barnabas because Barnabas means encourager. We read about him in verse 36. He sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. We'll hear more about Barnabas later on in the story of the church as we go through the book of Acts. But, but what a wonderful nickname. Did you ever have a nickname when you were a child? I'm not sure, Shorty or some such thing. But I'd love to have had this nickname, Encourager. Later when no one believed that Paul was converted or had become a Christian, it was Barnabas who went to him and literally took him by the hand and introduced him to the church and to the apostles at the church in Jerusalem. What an encourager he was. You know, every church needs an encourager or encouragers. There are lots of critics, we all know about that. <laughs> but the church needs encouragement. So may you and I be Barnabas at Innocent Baptist Church. But it was just at this high point in the church's life that the enemy attacked. I, you know, we know this also personally, don't we? When things are going well, yeah, yeah, well, this is great. And all of a sudden, things just sort of go awry in our lives. Another storm arose to threaten to sink the good ship, Christ Church in Jerusalem. Secondly, I want you to notice the nature of Satan's counterattack. This attack was more subtle than simple intimidation or mere violence. When they had faced opposition from outside, they prayed for boldness. But now they experience opposition from the inside. Let me read chapter 5 and verse 1. And I think the, the preposition here is but. You can say it now, but, but a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. And with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. Whenever you see the word but, it always is drawing a contrast, either a good contrast or a bad contrast. And this particular but draws a very bad one. As several commentators have suggested a, a parallel here between this story and Achan, the sin of Achan in Joshua chapter 7, you may remember that. God said, when you capture Jericho, leave all the goods there. Don't take any of it. They're under the ban. And Achan went out and he stole clothing and silver and so on. But there's also a more compelling parallel between Barnabas and, and Ananias. Both were wealthy. Both owned property. Both sold their property and both brought the proceeds of the sale to the apostles. 
So here's the question. What precisely was the nature of their sin or their offense? Let me just say very br briefly what it was not. The issue was not that they held back some of the money. Say the property was worth $50,000. If they had sold it for $50,000 and donated to the church $30,000 and kept back $20,000, that would have been perfectly fine. Or if they chose not to sell the property, but hold on to it, that also would have been perfectly fine. Remember, donations of this kind were voluntary. No one was forcing them to sell their property. Peter it actually confirmed this. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? It was theirs. They could do with it as they will, as they saw fit. So, what was the sin they were guilty of? I want to say that their sin was the guilt, but their, their, their sin was the sin of hypocrisy. You see, they were putting on a front. They were play acting. They were wearing a mask. Uh, the word hypocrite comes from the ancient Greek word of uh, actors who performed in a Greek play, in Greek drama. Uh, they wore a mask. Uh, they were playing a part. They were play acting. And that's exactly what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They were play acting. They were pretending to be someone they were not. In this instance, they gave the impression that they gave the entire $50,000 to the church. But in reality, they only gave $30,000 and kept back the $20,000 for themselves. See, that was pretense. You see, what they, were, what they were guilty of here, they were seeking the praise of men. They were glory seekers, if you will. They wanted the, the pretense of being seen as sacrificial givers, but without the sacrifice. Their motive was not to relieve the poor. Their motive was to stroke their own egos. And yet there was something more. We need to read Peter's verdict here in verse 3 of chapter 5. More importantly, they, they see they succumb to, to Satan's craftiness. We read in verse 3, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? You see, Peter saw behind what was going on at the physical level. Of course, they were both humanly responsible. They couldn't blame the devil for their sin. But Satan was behind all of this. You see, this was another attack of Satan upon this very young church in Jerusalem with its very young new believers. And Ananias had allowed Satan to fill his heart. What a scary statement that is. You know, just as Judas allowed Satan to fill his heart. Did you not? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, we read in John's Gospel, as soon as Judas took the bread at the Passover meal, we read, Satan entered into him, right at the communion table, if you will. And then he walked out of that upper room, and John's Gospel records this line, and it was night. Now, John wasn't just saying, wasn't just giving us a time marker. It was nighttime. What John is saying is that Judas then woke out into the goddamn light. That's what he's saying. But notice something else, something even worse. Peter says, you haven't just lied to me or to the church, you have lied to God. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You know, it's one thing to lie to me or to sort of lie to each other from time to time. It's another thing to lie to the Holy Spirit. You see, because to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God, because the Holy Spirit is the blessed third person of the triune God. And Peter tells us in verse 4, you have not just lied to, to a human being, but to God. I want to say this, you see, 
The, the church serves as God's representative. That's you and me. Remember when Jesus was apprehended, when, uh, when Jesus apprehended Saul on the way to Damascus? And he, that bright light shone upon him. What did Jesus say to Saul? He didn't say, Saul, why are you giving my people a hard time? He didn't say that. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, the church is part of the body of Christ. And to abuse the church is to abuse Christ himself. To lie to the church is to lie to Jesus himself. Because the church acts in the name of Christ. Ananias' name means Yahweh is gracious. A lovely name. Sapphira's name means beautiful. But sadly, they didn't live up to their names, did they? Tragically, neither one lived up to their names. And Ananias, or Sapphira, she too lied to the Holy Spirit. She, she too was culpable. And she waited three hours. I'm not sure what she was doing. I guess to get the story straight, I'm not sure, but, but she refused to repent. And when she was asked the same question, how much money did you give to the church? She continued the lie, the sham. And so she was equally guilty. She bore the same consequence as her husband. Even though Peter had given her ample opportunity to repent. There was a dark day in the life of the church. Let me just simply say this in passing, if you will. We must not lie to one another. We read Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. We read there, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. That's the old life. We're now new in Christ. So let's tell the truth to one another in love. And again in Ephesians 4 we read, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. See, there's always a reason why we do what we do as the people of God. When one person sins in the body of Christ, we all suffer. Just as when one rejoices, we all rejoice. Because we're all part of this one body of Christ. Our time is short this morning, so let me haste now to my last point. And this is probably a question that you're asking. Why was this punishment so severe? What lessons can they be here for us? Uh, some of the scholars, if you read them, they, they always have a way out. They took and said, well, Luke was just making up the story. It's not, wasn't, it was legendary. It wasn't legendary. <coughs> Other people tried to exonerate God by placing the blame on Peter. He 